Good evening and happy Sunday, everybody. It is, uh, yeah, it's another Sunday night and, uh, you know, uh, weather's getting a little nicer up here and uh, life is good. I've uh, had a very busy week this past week and uh, it's actually a busy week that's been about two years in the making. Uh, just about two years ago, our bishop announced that we were going to have a diocesan synod, S Y. N O D synod. And, um, you know, maybe you've heard about synods happening in Rome, but that is not something that only the uh, Roman pontiff is able to do, something that a regular old diocesan bishop is able to call, is able to call together uh, those whom he wishes in order to um, have a, uh, a very formal church meeting. Um, and whenever you do something like this, there's always going to be a little bit of skepticism. Are we making the right decision here? Is all of this uh, time, energy, uh, money, uh, is this all going to be well spent? And I'm, I'm quite happy to say that my expectations were exceeded. Um, I thought that this was very valuable uh, for our diocese to engage in this uh, synodal process. Um, <clears throat> And just reflecting over uh, what it was that made this work, I think, can uh, uh, hopefully it'll be interesting. And if it's not interesting, you're free to go uh, watch something else on YouTube right now. So um, what we did is we had basically a two-day meeting. Um, this was broken up. There was about 300 participants. It was... Uh, uh, probably about half priests or deacons and the other half representatives from all the parishes in our diocese. And uh, as a part of this two year preparation process, what we were getting together was uh, the topics that we are going to be talking about, uh, what it is that we're actually going to be voting on. Um, and these topics had, uh, there was this whole process where we had done uh, listening sessions, where we had done consultations, and, and uh, drawing together a list of proposals. Um, uh, proposals were all discussed uh, at our tables ahead of time, and then we voted on which ones we would send uh, to the front. Um, and then we had, uh, you know, periods of uh, open mics where uh, people got two minutes to speak on one or more of the proposals, uh, whatever it is that they uh, thought about them. And then, um, uh, opportunity to maybe offer amendments to the uh, proposals, and then uh, finally voting on whether or not we would recommend these proposals to the bishop. And I think that this ended up being a good use of our time and resources. Now, the first thing that I want to highlight is the fact that, as far as I could tell, everybody in the room had the same goal. We were bringing people together who were all Catholic and who all want to see uh, Jesus Christ proclaimed and um, God glorified through his church. We all had that same goal together. And this meeting would not have worked if somebody had come in there with their own thoughts and ideas, if there had been some deviation uh, from that fact that unified us. If, if there had been, let's say, four or five different goals in that room, this really would have been a waste of time. But because all of the people who had come together in the synod uh, had this same goal, I think it was worthwhile. The second was is that there were clearly established rules about how this was going to go. Um, and so, like I said, when people would get off uh, get in front of everybody with the microphone in their hand and address the assembly, either in favor of one of the proposals or offering a modification. They had a, a two-minute time limit. They had a screen that had the timer counting down, and the vast majority of people finished their interventions before um, the time ran out. There were a few people who went just over a little bit, like they were finishing a sentence. That's fine. There was only a couple instances where people seemed to be ignoring that time limit. They, they were very few and far between, usually didn't go over more than about 10 seconds. And so because everybody was abiding by the rules and agreeing to the rules, they were able to participate with each other in this way. 
Uh, a third thing that made it um, useful is because we all had the same goal, because we all wanted the same things, then the discussions we were have were were having were uh, this is about the most effective means about how we're going to carry this out, right? We weren't debating on what direction we were going. And it was very clear, and it has been very clear from the beginning, and it's clear in the canon law of the Catholic Church and the whole tradition that this is not uh, a democratic assembly where we get to vote on doctrine. Uh, it's not like this is an assembly that was going to be able to um, uh, touch any of the controversial teachings of the church. And frankly, the as far as I could tell, there weren't really anybody there who thought this was going to be that kind of an assembly and who would have wanted to do that. So we had brought together a group of people who all wanted the same things, which meant that we were able to speak very freely about controversial issues in our diocese. And none of the issues that we talked about were more controversial than the age at which uh, the children are confirmed in our diocese. In most dioceses across the United States, confirmation would be celebrated somewhere between uh, sixth grade and the end of high school. And in our diocese, we do it uh, what we call the restored order. We do it in third grade at the same time as their first communion. And since this was implemented 20 years ago, it has been uh, continually argued about, continually uh, debated. And um, I think the bishop quite wisely allowed it to be on the agenda here so that uh, it could be represented. So we all came together with the same goal. We all agreed to the same um, uh, rules and uh, uh, way of conducting ourselves. And we were free to speak freely about things, even when it was um, even when it was a controversial thing. And people were able to recognize that we all wanted the same thing, uh, ultimately, and we were just debating about the means of it. So at the very end of this, we had uh, our proposals. We had made amendments and modifications to the proposal, and. Uh, there was a final half hour uh, before the closing mass uh, that was dedicated to voting. So this was actually a democratic process. You got to vote, approve this proposal, uh, disapprove, uh, approve with reservations or abstain. And um, we get to vote and uh, let our, our voices be heard. Um, and ultimately the Catholic church still has a monarchical structure. And so uh, this was a merely consultative vote. Now, uh, the bishop did not put all of his own time and all of the resources of the diocese to bring together a consultative vote that he was just going to ignore. Um, if you don't want consultation, um, then you don't have to go and ask for it if you're a diocesan bishop. And we haven't had a diocesan synod since 1951. And nobody was, you know, saying that we had a right to a synod or anything like that. Um, so I don't think the bishop would have uh, asked for all this consultation um, if he had not actually wanted it. Uh, and, um, you know, we had uh, quite a bit of prayer um, as a part of the uh, week as well and uh, some, some dinners together. And overall, it was a, a good experience because we all wanted the same things. We agreed to the same rules. We disagreed freely. And frankly, um, this is all, it's all very clear that what he does with his feedback is the responsibility of our bishop. So, ah, you know, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work for me because I had to uh, organize masses with large numbers of priests, and that's always complicated. Uh, but it was joyful work, and I'm glad I was able to go through with it. Uh, and I think this was a manifestation of the body of Christ, the whole body of Christ, uh, the bishop together with the clergy and the lay faithful working towards giving glory to God and saving souls. Uh, Catholic Church being a true spiritual body and being able to move in that way, it's just a beautiful thing to see. Uh, you love to see it happen. That And it wasn't any longer than it was. Three days, that's all we needed. And the first day was just the opening mass at a dinner, 
Second day was a very long day. The third day was over by about 145. So that's, um, yeah, getting that all organized together is why I, uh, you know, I maybe been slightly less online than uh, I ordinarily am. So that's what I've got. If uh, if somebody doesn't hop on here pretty soon, I'm just going to go to bed because uh, today I had two confirmations with the bishop just here in town, so we didn't have to do any uh, any long road trips. But um, that is uh, it's still a little bit of work after having a very very long day. I uh, I made a very strongly worded intervention. One of the proposals was let's encourage people to people people to keep the Sabbath. Um, and uh, I made a, a very strong proposal that the Catholic Church needed to go to war on unnecessary labor and youth sports on sa Sundays. Um, and I got applause for that. So there we are. How you doing, Mark? Yeah, I'm hanging in. I'm, uh, I'm feeling better now that I don't feel sick. So oh. yeah, it's always nice to be on the other side of your sudden illness. So, Well... Looks like you're still six feet over, not six feet under. So, yeah, it wasn't wasn't feeling that way after I did my work outside. But <laughs> once I have my two and a half hour nap for no reason, I was right as rain. So, all righty, very good. <sighs> what is this wacky story of like agreement and cooperation and reciprocally opening towards a good end? This is. Crazy. Yeah, I know. Everything's just supposed to be collapsing chaos these days, isn't it? <laughs> it must be. No opposition, no skepticism, no conspiracy. Like this is, and, and and what is this like opening with communion, and and then like, oh, we're not going to talk about anything today. We're just going to eat together and get to know each other. <laughs> this is crazy talk. What is going on? Cats and dogs living together. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm sorry to make you so upset about this. I'm I'm just I'm concerned. Like what what is this mode of being? Never heard of this before. It's delightful. It's delightful. One of the priests who's a rather passionate and excitable fellow got up to the microphone and recommended that we do this every 5 years. And I'm like, "Oh man. It's two year preparation process, man. Like every 10 is about as often as I can see this happening cuz you know, we fed 300 people for, what, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, right? And then just the bishop drove all over the place, and we did all these listening sessions. It's just like, this is a lot of work. We can't do this every five years. Holy mackerel. That's hey, 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 there were women representatives at this. This was under the 83 Code of Canon Law, not the 17 Code of Canon Law. 17 Code of Canon Law, only priests would be at the uh, Synod uh, as voting know. members. I don't know why they'd want to. Like, why does everybody think everybody should be involved in everything all the time? Like, I, I don't. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, like, I just, I, I don't. I, I, you know, like, I could have told Ted, like, Ted, I want to be in on your convivium planning. I did not want to do that. <laughs> I wanted to enjoy it. And I damn well did. You know why? Because I didn't have to think about any of it at all. I just had to show up and be me. It's real easy to be me. I've been doing it my whole life. I'm great at it. Now, Andrew, there was a choir, a very nice, very big choir, beautiful music. Everybody said it was fabulous. Everybody knew it was fabulous. Um, and, and you would have fit right in there. And you would just come for mass. And then you would have been able to just go home. So... You know, there was a level, and then people were invited to the big opening and closing masses, which were, you know, we did it right. We did it right. Big lit liturgies. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, people don't appreciate that. Like, being able to go in and do the thing you're good at or the thing you enjoy, and then not having to be involved in the rest of it. Mm -hmm, what, mm -hmm. what a gift. <laughs> <laughs> what an absolute gift. Because it, it is, it's a gift. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. you get to do the thing you're good at. Somebody else usually sets it up for you. Right. They do all the work 
And then you can do the thing you're good at, be appreciated for it, and then leave and not have to be involved in stuff that maybe you're not good at or don't know anything about or don't, you know, don't need to have a say in or, or, or if you had a say in it, you'd make it worse. <laughs> yeah, that's actually like part of what made this work is that only the people who came are the people who really care. Right. 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 It was like the people who I'm not going to say that everybody initially really wanted to be there, but once they got a sense of what was going on and how it was being run, it's like, yeah, it, this is this is the most faithful people from every parish, you know, so they want to see right. things thrive. Um, yeah. People don't appreciate that. I mean, that's what happened on the Verviki Discord server. Right. They let a bunch of people who did not care and were not involved have a vote, have a say. And they blew it up. Completely to the point where Verveki stopped going there. Like they just ruined their own thing because they let people who were there, I mean, they were on there. Some of them have been members for years at that point, uh, but they weren't involved. Like they didn't come to things, they didn't do anything. They were, you know, occasionally they'd be in the text channels, you know, causing trouble because that's what they did. Um, and they were allowed this big vote. And, uh, you know, it, it turned into an awful, horrible, actually demonic place. You know, it's like, well, you know, and it, and it got destroyed and, you know, and that's, and that's part of the problem, you know, are you making the case for gatekeepers? Oh my. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's worse than that. See, people think it's gatekeeping. The thing people are complaining about is actually not gatekeeping and it's not called gatekeeping. And that is just a misnomer. Uh, not to say that there isn't gatekeeping, but most often what people are talking about is barrier to entry. One barrier to entry is IQ, by the way, and nobody objects to IQ. <laughs> it's it's kind of weird. Like, like uh, uh, oh, science is being gatekept. Yeah, by high IQ people, for one thing. Not only that, but that's, but that's the barrier to entry, too. So what, do, what are you saying? You should let non-academics or maybe people who aren't smart enough to, to get a degree be in charge of scientific papers? Like, uh, you know, like, like, there's a barrier to entry. And mm -hmm. you can call that gatekeeping if you want, but you're wrong and that's dumb and you're not going to solve any problems thinking that way. And again, some things are gate kept, right? But also there are gates and they need to be kept. And if you don't have gates, you get destruction. So and it, it's just weird to me. I'm like, you guys, I, like I get the, you know, the, the oversimplification, but yeah, gatekeeping is most often just about the barrier to entry being held so that people can't, um, you know, can't just do what they want. Yeah, there's a barrier to enter the stream. Like, is there a bit? Yes, you have to have your camera on unless you're well known, right? Why? And and when that barrier is broken, uh, usually people troll the stream. So yeah, no, no, no. I just, just, uh, I just ban them if I can get to them fast enough. But 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 the bottom line is, there's a barrier to everything in your life. Yeah. Get over it. <laughs> it always has been. Well, and like, these barriers, these barriers are a good thing, right? And so um in our diocese, we've got our marriage tribunal. The marriage tribunal can look at nullity, right? And if they can get a declaration for nullity for one of your marriages, then you might be free to marry again, right? Um yes. it comes with a $25 filing fee, right? Now it is these annulments, they have hundreds of specialized man hour labors into them. And it is a benefit of our diocese that we have all of that funded via donations. Mm -hmm. So we don't, you know, somebody's, let's say, got a complicated situation going on. We don't have to hand them a bill in order to give them the declaration of nullity. But it does come with that $25 filing fee. So yeah. that you're not just going to come and waste our time because, you know, right. the 25 bucks, you could get a nice steak dinner um or maybe a not so nice right. you can get a right. decent part of a nice steak dinner for that and like yeah yeah it's got to be you got to put a little bit of a little bit of uh a little bit of money into it but that's not a, a barrier that is going to keep people out you have but to show just, that you care yeah at least that much at least 25 dollars worth you know and but that most people can afford $25. Well, and you have to and if pay they it. really needed to, like if the priest said, hey, this person is really serious about it, but they're flat broke, we just waive the $25 fee. But right. somebody, somebody's uh, advocating for you. Right, 
Right. And, and that's what people and and the thing is people also don't understand barriers at all. Um and, and I like what I like what Casey pointed out. You have to be on the internet, which means you have to have a computer or a phone or an internet connected device. Those are barriers. Those are different barriers too, by the way. Uh I have I have a phone that's not internet connected. Like you know, like that's a co possible combination. You also have to be smart enough to use it. You also have to get into the appropriate forum, whether it's the YouTube channel or StreamYard or whatever, right? And you also have to find it. Like all of these things are barriers. We don't think about them, but they're all barriers. <laughs> There's lots of barriers for everything in your in your life. It's one of those things I used to get really upset with people because in software they'd say things like, "Oh yeah, you know, I can't." I can't do that. That software is proprietary. I'm like, no, literally open source. And they'd be like, oh, that, you know, that company did this thing. And I'm like, yeah, but actually that's just an open source project. And all they did was put a skin on it. And they're like, oh no. And I'm like, well, if you don't like it, you could do the same thing. And you actually could, except more often they couldn't because they just weren't good enough software engineers. And so you're not good enough to do this. Why are you bitching that somebody else is? I don't understand. You know, and I, like I have plenty of qualms with plenty of tech companies on really good grounds. But like not all of them and most of them are, you know, they're doing something that's harder for than than most people can do and good for them. I want to respond to this. Um, I think what uh, Dr. Peterson's upset about with the universities is that they are no longer fulfilling their proper function right. in at all. Let's say at least training people. But how about actually properly educating them? Because a university could right. do that if it was well run enough. Um, right. And so uh, I think he uh, is more upset about that than the fact that, and then he's just making a fuss about it. And well, you know, if it really is, uh, if, if the University of Toronto really is perverted from its final end, then the uh, the person who's trying to write the course is not going to be acceptable to the diseased right. host. So that's what well, I think is more likely to go on there. And and actually, Peterson's complaining about the opposite, right? Because what happened to universities, they stopped gatekeeping. And they let people in who didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. And those people climbed up. The, they, they let them in in two ways. They let them become administrators, right? And some of them climbed up in and became administrators or professors, right? And they corrupted the place. And there's no question about that. So it's the lack of gatekeeping that killed the universities. Because now the universities aren't special. You know, you, you can look at it two ways. You can say, oh, education's, you know, available on YouTube now. Or you can realize that actually that's completely false. Um, the standard of education in the university is so low that any idiot with a camera can train people just as well. That's actually what happened. I have a lot of proof for this, by the way. And that's really the issue, is that education quality at the top tier universities is now so freaking poor that a, a lot of people can train you as well as their professors can. And that's horrific. Because it basically means that those degrees are worth less, not not nothing. So so years and years and years ago, this guy, um, I think his name is Andrew Ng, um, and he used to be at I think it's Stanford. It was one of the big universities, it was one of the, one of the big schools. It might have been one of the California schools. Anyway, it was one of the early online lecture series courses for AI and machine learning. Like it was one of the first one. I think it was 10 episodes. I watched them all over the weekend. What year would this be about? I'm a crazy person. That was a long time ago. Is it mid 2000s? It was mid 2000s. A long time okay. Ago. Okay. Yeah. Very early. Yeah. I was I was there. Like I was I was in the middle of the we can teach people online movement and I was like that ain't going to work. You guys are all going to fail. All it's those gonna, It's not going to work as well. It's only going to be as good as your students. All the yeah, right, but all the companies that did it failed. Like I could okay. just list off names and none of them are here anymore, right? And okay. I, I, I could get into why. But but so this guy gives this course and I take the damn course because I take courses like, yeah, let's learn this. And I got a lot out of the course. But then I was watching what, the, so this is another hybrid thing, right? Like he's actually giving the lectures and they're just recording them. A la J, you know, JBP style, right? This is way before that. I think this is, Oh, it might have been on YouTube, but there was a uh, website, I don't know if it's still up, called videolectures.net, which is even way better because you could get the lecture notes and all kinds. It wasn't just videos. It was it was uh, form fit for lectures, right? It was a platform designed not just for videos or, or audios, but also for the slides and stuff. So what happened was they had this online forum that was talking about you know what was good about this course. 
and you know it was part of the university's uh, program to get online. So you know you go and see, right? I mean, I wasn't paying the university, obviously, I wasn't a student. Um, and what every person said was the best part about this course is not the lectures, because if you haven't been to a college, especially back in the day when they did more of this, you don't really understand. Most of the teaching at the at the very best colleges didn't come from the professor at all. That isn't how it worked. It's not that it wasn't the professor's material. It was just taught by his assistants, basically, right? And what would happen was they were learning MATLAB. And MATLAB, especially back then, was, I mean, it was sort of coming out from the shadows of, you know, being an exclusive gate-kept club of people who liked math and new math tools, right? Uh, it, now there are free equivalents to MATLAB. So you don't have to learn MATLAB anymore. You don't have to buy MATLAB. There's free equivalents. There's a couple of them. Wolfram did one, and uh, the GNU project has one. Uh, I think it's called Octave. And um, they said, oh, we learned how to use MATLAB, and that got me a job. Not the AI course. There was, a, again, it was a very early AI course. Not the AI course. Not at all. And so it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, it, it's it's not the lectures are not the magic. Um, but the fact that you can learn as much or more from a lecture from somebody who's never even been to college, um, you know, as you can from a college lecture or even a college course, which is even more frightening, uh, just to shows you the education levels come down and there's less gatekeeping. And there should be more gatekeeping because then you know when you get somebody with a college degree that they can actually do what they say and not somebody like AOC who clearly did not understand any bit of her economics course. Just didn't get it, right? For whatever reason, like I mean, that's not her fault, but they shouldn't have let her, they shouldn't have given her a degree if she didn't understand the material. Like it's not that hard, right? But they didn't do that. They didn't gatekeep and they're just giving out degrees for money. And like, I'm not a fan. Like, I I don't think I don't think if somebody pays you, you give give out a degree. And you and you could know this because you a few years ago, people were like, "We'll just give you a degree if you give us money from our university." And I'm like, "There's no classes? No, no, no. They just give you a degree from you know blah 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 university or whatever." And nobody stopped them from doing this. Is this is over ten years ago? This was happening. It's still happening, right? And nobody's stopping them. So. You know what what happens? Like what why is this happening? How do I know anybody's qualified for anything? I I got nothing. That's the problem. It's a lack of gatekeeping. It's you know, if you don't filter out the people who aren't up to the job, you're gonna get a bunch of people who aren't up to the job doing the job. And that's not good for anybody. The next thing you know, uh wings will be coming off of planes mid-flight, father. Oh no. It sounds like Man is being struck for his hubris and taking to the skies. Gatekeeping is good. It keeps you, it keeps planes from falling out of the sky. It is. It is. Yes. And uh, you know, you have to be kind of mean to actually uh, actually keep somebody out nowadays. Um, I'll do it. I'll be mean. That's fine. Okay. I'm good. Cool. I'm glad there's Don't somebody. Care. There's somebody here who's uh, Don't who, care. who's willing to do it. Yeah. Don't yeah. know you. Your feelings are not important to me. Sorry. Just the way life is. I can't care about everybody's feelings, so I don't don't even try. But this is just basically like a failure of the immune system in a spiritual body, right? right. It, it, it's just amazing. It, it's it's self reflect or what is it? Self similar fractal patterns on every level, right? Yes. If yes. your body gets overrun by foreign uh contaminants foreign agents that don't share that same purpose yeah that the body has then it'll be destroyed well well in the body what are un, what are what is a growth of undifferentiated cells called cancer yeah. <laughs> undifferentiated the the way to differentiate one way to differentiate is to gatekeep no gatekeepers you get cancer you want cancer that's how you get cancer. No, actually, it's like I don't yeah. know what else to tell you. Yeah. So it's um, it's just you know starting with the uh, topic at the beginning of the street, the fact that our diocesan synod went well. Now, only part of that was possible because we didn't just let anybody in to vote, right? Right, and like you know, just knowing the priests of our diocese, knowing our bishop, and all of that, if somebody was going to come in and advocate for a revolution in Catholic doctrine, 
they just weren't going to be invited. Right. And it was understood. So like, like we were debating, you know, what age should we be doing um, confirmation at? Should we be encouraging people to use communion rails or not? Like, is that a direction we should go in? Um, do, should we uh, have be encouraging silence before mass? You know, it was more like, which of these are we going to prioritize versus, um, you know, or should we be giving communion under both forms at every mass? <laughs> like, yeah. These are all things we can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna get into perfection doctrine now. Somebody wants to live in a perfect world. Yeah, sounds like they're evil. <clears throat> it, happens, Next. it happens all the time for all kinds of things. Nothing is perfect, including gatekeeping. Oh, wah, wah, wah. We live in an imperfect world. Who knew? It's almost like the world has fallen or something. What are we gonna do? We're gonna just keep our consciences pure and try and do good things. Gabby gets it. I voted yes on the communion rails. I know that's going to be shocking to everybody in the uh, in the audience, but I did I did vote yes on the communion rail. It's we're we're not Greeks, Mark. We have to kneel. The Romans have to kneel, otherwise they'll just keep on conquering. Ooh, I like that. I like that. I can. I sure. I got to got to kneel. Right. I, like we just got to make a habit out of kneeling before God, reminding us that there is in fact something that we cannot conquer. Oh, ah, boy, deep symbolism, deep symbolism takes from Father Eric. I'm all in now. That's fantastic. Yeah, well, that, that beats the cool. Greeks right there. The Orthodox don't do that. Well, they, they, they have different ways of getting there. You know, it's like maybe their liturgies last three hours long and that fixes things. Yeah, There's more well, than one do, correct way to cut these things. They do, and they say Theotokos a million times and then spread in a, a wisdom every once in a while just to confuse Wisdom. Them. Yeah. Oh, the guy, uh, the guy in the church in West Columbia that I go to who, who does that. I'm like, oh, man, I want to hire him to do like something because the way he says wisdom is awesome. Like, it sounds great. Sometimes you got to throw a gate into a gate. Well, but nice rebellion, Sally. Yeah, I uh, I don't think the uh, general instruction of the Roman Missal should have let uh, bishops decide that. They do. The law clearly says they can, but more kneeling. You arrogant Romans. Down, you arrogant Roman dogs on you your knees. Kneel before your God. You, you, it's good for you. Trust me. <laughs> It'll make you better. Yeah, kneeling before your God will make you a better person. Yeah, I think I think uh, you know a lot of the problem too is you know people people seem to think that bad gatekeeping is you know this horribly oppressive thing. You know, people just get around it. I, I mean, like, why do you think Jordan Peterson started his own university, guys? You think, oh, they're doing the wrong thing. We'll do it better. Uh, okay, that's always what happens. The story. Like, everyone's whining. I'm like, you should read some history. It's very calming. <laughs> You'll find out. It's very calming. The old institutions get corrupt, and then somebody goes and founds a new. That's like you look at like the history of monasticism in the West. It's like every hundred years or so, there's a revival movement and a few new monasteries that are finally going to do it right. Until right. we got to the Carthusians, and then they nailed it and haven't lost it. It's amazing. But they're <laughs> also they're also just. It's like oh yeah, you want to you're going to be praying like fourteen or fifteen hours a day if you're with us. So it's like. That's how they manage. Just, just keep the standards up here. Yeah. Well, that's that's good. Well, and it, and it's like Peterson says: the solution to this is to recognize where people are not taking responsibility or where they're not looking, and take it yourself. That's the everybody wants to complain and nobody wants to fix it, even though you know if they were competent they could. And if you're not competent, you're you're going to be oppressed. That's probably true. Get over it. Move on with your life. I don't know what else to tell you. If you can't maybe do you could thing, just you go find a competent it. person and convince convince them to help you fix it, and then you no, no. just help you them. just drive them. No, yeah, help them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And if you're just you like their driver it, or whatever. Help someone who can. It's like what can then I do? Be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Yeah. What can I do? You can fold programs. Okay. 
whatever it is, maybe that's the best you can do. But someone's got to do it, though. So that's super helpful. Like, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Oh, we got we've got fans of Carthusians in here and everything. Jeez. Oh, yeah. What's oh, the yeah. world coming to? Carthusians are good. Tommies are bad. Yeah, the communism thread is everywhere. I think people are starting to notice it. <laughs> and the gates of hell will not keep or anything like that. That's a Bible quote. That book you haven't read, Mark. I've heard a lot about it, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I can never, what's the name again? Because there's no author and the name's like one word and it's very hard to remember. Very hard to remember. Oh, need more handles. Need more mm -hmm. handles on that one. Mm hmm yeah i mean there are definitely days where i'm like i don't think anyone's heard about this thing because no not not read it but heard about it because <laughs> they're always like if only there were a place to go for wisdom and i'm like um i i think i think we solved that one i'm 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 fairly i'm feeling pretty good that that is a solved problem like a proverb just, you know. or literally the wisdom of solomon it's right there yeah i <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a and it's always worse right because these you know these people are like well you know i i i don't i don't know where to go you know but but i read plato and i'm like are you saying there's no wisdom in plato or are you saying the wisdom isn't applicable let me introduce you to republic uh which apparently you either misread or forgot i don't know which but but actually a lot of this stuff is in there already I, I wanna I wanna take a little little bit from the uh, the comments here. Gabby says I've been working on getting my mom back to the Catholic Church, and she's at a point where I think she would be interested in taking the next step. I just worry that RCIA will be a letdown. Well, maybe it's good to get the letdown in there early uh, rather than waiting until you've really uh, fallen in love with the thing. Uh, how do you help someone through that process? She needs first communion and confirmation, uh, and probably a confession too, which is usually more intimidating for people than uh, first communion and confirmation and you know with some of these things the best thing you could do is to just practice works of satisfaction prayer fasting and give alms work on your own uh connection to god work on your own uh life and the spirit and all of that um and really you know making prayer the first effort you make uh, for this person prayer and fasting if you can manage it um because we don't operate on merely human power here you know i'm talking about how great all of this uh synod stuff went and uh and how it's uh, really going to be useful um but i don't think any of it would have been possible without a fair amount of prayer that had gone into the whole two-year preparation process the fact that we really ask the lord to be a part of it and the whole synod started off with a vote of ma a vote a mass asking god to bless it so uh more important than you know reading the right books or saying the right things is your connection to god and being a conduit of the holy spirit for your mother so uh yeah as jesus says some of these demons can only be uh delivered by prayer so that's all I got for you. Exemplification for the win. Yeah. That's that's the that's that's how I did summarize that. I uh it's uh spring here and and I've got allergies. So good job. That's what happens right. every year. Um Yeah, that's right. Press like you lazy bums. Gotta let algorithm know how great this is. Yeah. yeah. That's probably a quote that Casey's got. Simply be a saint and heaven will follow in your wake. And the fact that she's interested is already a miracle. All right, we're just going to stack miracles on top of miracles. That's how this stuff works. Calm down, Casey. <laughs> Smash that like button. Actually, right. like I, I kind of right. don't want it to get bigger than this because i'll probably have more trolls yeah you you already have trolls it's a good thing you're a good game well, they, they see this and they're like oh it'd be funny wouldn't it 
Some of them do, yeah. Uh, no, I think we we got more trolls without without that lure, but maybe we had more watchers too. I don't know. Back in the bad old days when we were on the other stream yard. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Twitch. We had Twitch uh, people. So that might, that filter yeah, might have something to do with it. I, I, I don't, I don't know Twitch. No Twitch. That's basically it. No Twitch. Yeah. Twitch is. Every once hot. in a while, if I need to take a nap, I'll put on a, a speed run, you know, just because I fall asleep to them. Um, <laughs> That's great. Oh, the priest of the Roman Catholic Church, huh? Well, there are some places that we don't go because they're evil, and Twitch is one of them. Yeah. Just kidding. I don't know. Maybe maybe some of you guys stream on Twitch. I don't know. Twitch is uh, an interesting place. But yeah, I mean, if you if you want to reach the worst of the worst. I'm not sure I can go that far down into the depths. Um, it's almost as if people have limits. It's a good thing the idea of Twitch is a bunch of gatekeepers that keep you off of Twitch. You actually have to do something to get onto it, like a barrier to entry or something. Weird. No, no, we're, we can't. League of Legends? Ugh. Just, uh, see yeah. now we have you know our our part of the bible and um it says uh do not throw your pearls before swine um and i think that's uh that's yeah that's uh twitch twitch is swine twitch is a bunch of pigs yeah well this is that deep confusion between layers right and abstractions it's like someone should preach to the trolls or minister to the trolls, but maybe not anyone, and maybe not everyone, and maybe not any priest or every priest. I don't know. Could be a thing. I think of this guy that I, we used to see at the seminary. He had this old van that was just painted all of these outrageous colors, and he would just like drive around and talk to homeless people. And he was just, you know, maybe he had been homeless at one point himself. He was just really interesting dude, always well behaved when he was in church. You know, he'd just come to the, the seminary chapel every once in a while. It's just a really interesting dude. And it's like, yeah, that's the guy who might be able to go minister to the trolls, you know, it was a little little farther out. And I'm a very I'm I'm an organizer. I'm a I'm a center personality. I don't really <laughs> do well at the fringes it's too chaotic i don't know what's going on be careful of them dog headed there father be yeah careful of them dog the roses heads them in yeah you're about as dog headed as i think i can manage mark <laughs> uh oh jacob's here to tell me i'm wrong hello jacob father i i'm 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 constantly trying to get pvk to stop saying we're getting too big and then you do it so, no, no, no. That is a very specific thing. Yeah, very specific. Very specific. I will have to change the way I do these Sunday night live streams if I get too big. He no. didn't, and he didn't, he didn't say, no, I don't want to get bigger. He yeah, said, I just, I'm not it, it sure just... I want that because it would change, which is a very different statement. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's added responsibility with all of that. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just letting, I'm letting the, the doctrine out into the wind. And if algorithm picks it up and makes me famous, then, then there we go. You know, um, I don't think just streaming once a week is how you build a big YouTube channel, though. Uh, it helps. You, you might get there. But uh, <laughs> did you, um, I'm sorry if you already spoke about this. I, I, I just started listening, but I wanted to know your opinion on the new, um, well, I thought it was an encyclical or a bull or a, even a motu proprio, but it wasn't any of those. It, it was something that came out of one of the, con uh, came out of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. It's it's called the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith now. Oh, Keep it up, Jacob. Sorry, I still yeah. call it the Inquisition. <laughs> but, uh, have, have you have you uh, have you actually? Uh, I have not actually sat down and read it. I, um, you know, I I saw that the Associated Press was really upset about it. 
Um, Lots so, of people are very upset about it. Yeah, so I was like, that's good. The right people are pissed off about it. And I saw some trads, and I looked at what they had to say. They were like, they were even tradier than I am, or or crazier, you know, one of the two. And I looked at it, and they're like, ah, I don't think you need to worry about saying that human beings have infinite dignity as long as you understand that it's a relative infinity, not an absolute infinity, because the only absolute infinity is God. So I don't know. That's we defensible. Are made in the image of God. Right. So it's it's only relative to our creation that we can have uh, inestimable i think an inestimable worth of every human being would would or, or uh, incalculable would be a more precise way to say it okay so yeah. so it only apply, applies within creation okay i'm i'm fine with that yeah <laughs> um there was more of this death penalty stuff and like i'm not even like that big a fan of the death penalty because um you can't really back that one up uh, so if you have a miscarriage of justice, you know, uh, but the the whole like the past since about 95, like the Vatican's been like, no, no death penalty. And I'm like, oh, gosh, guys, come on. It's, it's in the Bible. Like God commanded it. Okay. God commanded it. So it can't be intrinsically evil. Now, I know, Jacob, I know you're going to say they never actually executed anybody, but God certainly did. Right. Like God had, you know, the ground so, open up and swallow people. So right. that, that's so. I, I think it, I think it is it is necessary to have it on the books, and uh, like the Mishnah speaks about, maybe execute someone every seventy years, uh, one person every seventy years or so. But um, as the Bible clearly says, God does not wish for the wicked to die. Yeah, and God's wishes should be done. What if they're more than merely wicked? <sighs> Mark, this is a theological conversation, and you've explicitly <laughs> excluded yourself. From the I'm just asking a question. So we're going to do a little bit of gatekeeping thing. here and say. Uh, yeah. Me, me tata uh, I'm not sure you can be worse than a Russia. Sorry. Yeah. So anyway, I... Uh, you know, after the last um, document to come out of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, this one was just kind of a relief that I didn't really have to deal with it. Um, so, so that's 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 where I'm at nowadays with things coming out of the Vatican. It's like, oh, good, this one, this one didn't make anything any worse. But um, yeah, you know, Pope Francis, he's never been quite as progressive as the progressives have wanted him to. Like, he didn't open up married priesthood and he's he could be really like old school sometimes when it comes to like relationship between men and women he he goes around and he said once that uh that uh, women's uh, those who advocate women's ordination are just promoting female machismo which is just like only he could get away with saying that man i couldn't get away with saying that i get I, stoned i think it was him but it might have been benedict but one of the popes said I am uh, the Pope of both the people who want to press their feet on the gas pedal and the ones who want to press it on the brakes. And I, it's a bad idea to press your feet on both at the same time. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, unless, Mark, you're going to tell us about how dragging your brakes is actually a good thing. No, no. Oh, no. Don't do that. Goodness. You know how expensive brake pads are? No. I don't, and I don't want to find out. Oh my, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I I don't have I don't have that that big of a take. I know there's a few folks on BOM who read the whole thing. Apparently, it's not so terribly long that you can't actually read it, unlike some other documents that the uh, Vatican has uh, published with Pope Francis's uh, signature on it. So, did you get a chance to uh, listen to my discussion with Kale? I did not. I, like I, I said at the beginning of the podcast, this was a very busy week for us with our diocesan synod. So, um, what is a diocesan synod? It is a consultative uh, assembly for the bishop. Sounds like some commie stuff. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's no. a merely consultative vote. <laughs> okay. It's it's still it's, it's a still a monarchy, vote. Jacob. He could take all of our propositions that we gave to him and throw them out and write whatever he wants with his pastoral letter. Who gets to vote? 
those whom uh, so it's like the clergy of the diocese representatives of the laity and religious and those else whom the bishop wishes to okay so he gets to decide who votes yeah okay. yeah and he gets to, and and he gets to decide if the vote is valid or if he wants to ignore it very republican hey if if he, as long as he he gets to decide who votes and not everybody gets to vote i i will allow it yeah, this the assembly had about three hundred people in it, <laughs> okay. and I, I appreciate I appreciate your 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 blessing. I guess <laughs> um, the other piece of Catholic news uh, apparently Francis Courts really disliked the fact that um, the Vatican defrocked uh, well defrocked uh, kicked out laicized laicized a nun. Oh, oh, uh, she was dismissed from her, her vows. Yes. Um, well, first she was only dismissed for a few years, but but then um, they decided it was permanent, and she went to the French secular courts, and the French secular courts fined the cardinal $200,000 for lack of due process. So my... I, I could not figure out why she was she was dismissed from her vows, but I imagined it must have been well. Apparently, she's from a traditionalist community, though. Yeah, they come in all shapes and sizes, especially in France. Right. So I I couldn't I I really couldn't tell if it was because like she was too traditional or because. She was like campaigning for abortion. Either one could have been. I uh, I haven't followed this story. Let's see. I mean, it might be Pillar Catholic might have had a. Uh, I'm gonna go see if Pillar Catholic. By the way, for anybody who's listening, it's the uh, the best um, new Catholic news source on it, and our chancellor is good friends with the guys who run it. So. Uh, ba -ba. Uh, these are good dudes. We endorse. We endorse the good dudes. Their, their imperfection. Even in their imperfection. Yep. We have to endorse people's imperfection, right? Because nobody's perfect. So an endorsement is an endorsement of their particular imperfection. Better way to think about the world. Trust me, it'll help you. So from Catholic News Agency, French court sentences Cardinal Ouellette religious community to fines after expelling none. Whatever no, happened to laïcité, right? Well, I don't know how to actually pronounce that in French, but you know, this idea that we're just going to have everything be perfectly secular. Well, by that, I mean the French the French really do mean by secular they meant like kill all the priests. Yep. In the French Revolution, you mean? Is that that's why it even, started? They even, they even yeah. guillotine nuns, man. Like Yeah, say, yeah. Yeah. It'd be yeah. a real jerk to do that. I mean I mean, I I think it's still like illegal for like uh in right now to wear large crosses in in certain places in France. And it's like bishops not allowed here. <laughs> Yeah, they got that thing going on. I, uh, I, I don't, I don't get it. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. No, I, this, this is framed all backwards, right? Like kicking somebody out viol is a grave violation of the right to religious freedom. Like <laughs> that's not what religious freedom is. Like, this is the confusion between positive and negative rights. Like I have a right to do what I want, when I want, how I want. It's like, no, that you those rights never existed in any society historically or or in recent times. I, I don't know where people get this idea from. Well, you know, it's just this this is the European notion of rights and a lot of it's let up left up to the uh, judgment of the judges, you know. I mean that's they, not that's not classically European. This is a strictly recent past fifty years or sixty years problem. There's nothing, there's nothing, especially like European philosophical uh, thought is all top-down power from above, right? All, all ordained by God stuff, all of it. 
there's no there's no positive rights of individuals in the European thought. That's strictly an English thing and then a US thing later on. It, yeah, I don't I, I don't know where this comes from. It's it's very strange. Yeah. No, I haven't had much time for just consuming news. I've been in meetings or liturgies uh, or preparing for meetings and liturgies or cramming in my Latin homework. So so you've been doing priestly things. Right, rather than internet things. So I, I don't feel bad about not following these things closely. <laughs> I I 100% approve. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a weird story. The AP doesn't mention anything about what she might have done or what the internal investigation was about. So, you know, it, it, there's no there's no other side of the story there. It's all like her religious freedom was violated because she can't keep doing what she was doing after an internal investigation. And I'm like, that usually means you did something wrong and shouldn't be doing what you were doing. I, don't um, I mean, her lawyer is, according to Catholic News Agency, claims that um, she was uh, so. She was 15, 57, she is 57 years old, had reportedly lived in a monastery since 1987 without any significant incidents. That means she was like, how old when she, she was like 20 when she entered, I guess. And then in, in 2011, denounced serious abuses and facts happening in the community. The situation then escalated, her lawyer said. Um, after 34 years of religious life, she was dismissed from her community in October 2020 after a visit from Ouellette. Um, It was never made public what exactly the Vatican accused her of, and a complaint to Pope Francis against her dismissal was unsuccessful. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't have any insider information on this. I don't know if she got hosed by the Vatican, which... Is possible, uh, or if she's just a real piece of work and got dismissed for being a real piece of work, uh, that's also possible. Um, what I do know is that the saintly way of responding to these things usually isn't lawyering up. Yeah. Right. I mean, if it was like a church lawyer thing, that's one thing because you're 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 keeping it all in house, you know. But I mean, I guess it's like her sustenance after. Um, religious life she's got to figure out what to do now but it's 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 a very odd story um yeah i mean if she went into the convent i mean at age 20 and was there like 40 years almost since 1987 that's 37 years right so that's all she's known i don't know yeah, if I get any insider, maybe that's why I can't find anything on Pillar Catholic. They uh, they haven't gotten the insider scoop yet. Um, so, so we'll see. We'll have to we'll have to watch this story. It's it's uh, Saint Paul. You know, sorry, sorry, Jacob, sorry, but Saint Paul had things to say about you know taking your complaints before the secular courts. It's like you guys need to figure out how to settle this in house. So that was because during that time it was it was it's it's actually a huge issue um, because what people would do was would go to the Roman courts and the Roman courts were really uh, corrupt and basically uh, I mean it was a way of murdering people was to take them to Roman courts because they they basically thought Jewish life was worthless. So this is, this is actually, like, the Talmud and, and the Mishnah spend inordinate amounts of time condemning people who go to secular courts, but that was because of Roman rule and how it, it dealt with. So I, I'm in no way surprised that made it into the Christian early Christian community because, yeah, the, the Roman courts were notoriously corrupt. Especially for Jews, probably. I mean, the, the, my perspective, and it's definitely the perspective of somebody who's in school for canon law, is like, for religious life, we've got our own 
internal legal system that's got hundreds of years of tradition and development behind it. And ultimately, yeah. when it comes to it, the chief judge of the Catholic Church is the Pope. And if he hears your appeal and rules it against your favor, then, you know, at least we have an, an umpire that we can recognize, even yeah. if it's possible that he give bad decisions. Yeah. Well, there's this whole thing. I think it's in that crazy book you talk about, Father. I could render unto Caesar. Like, it's not unclear that there are two types of justice, right? We'll say one that's maybe of this earth and one that's kind of maybe not. And, 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 and that is a fundamental change from, uh, you know, if you want to call it a progression, I think that's a fair way to think about it, right? It used to be that the God and the emperor were the same. And then they sort of got separated, right? And then the the authority of the emperor or the king or whatever came down from the authority of that higher power, God, whatever, doesn't even matter, right, at that point. And, and, and now there's a separation between the authority of the highest power and the authority of the king or the elected official. I, I, I see nothing wrong with it. It seems reasonable to me. Yeah, so I'm not going to come down with a, uh, a strong uh, opinion on this case until I know more. Excellent. Back to the topic of streaming platforms. Are you streaming to Twitter? Me? No. No, just YouTube. Just the one. I Twitter is all... Twitter will not be good for me. Honestly, Only if you Twitter engage. is not good... Um, and I don't trust the numbers it shows, but it seems to show like really large numbers watching and I, to the point where I'm very doubtful, but um, yeah, that's been, that's been something, I mean, it's, it's easy to set up and you don't have to use your twi Twitter account. Um, that's the great thing about Twitter is people can decide to follow you and you you're actually probably best off not using your Twitter account because whenever you use your Twitter account, you risk getting blocked. And I've been blocked by so many people. Kale Zeldin has been blocked by even more people than I have, which is shocking. Because he's not, he doesn't strike me as a bomb thrower, you know? He's really? not. I don't know about that. Okay. I, look, look, I know Catholics, right? I know conservative catholics you know don't care what everybody thinks they're just gonna say the truth right and i i love these guys but they're best as farmers right and so um they uh they get in uh get in trouble on on twitter um i i i i, I, I want to answer don i don't i don't, I don't i'm not on twitter so i don't know what he's like on twitter so maybe hey, it's Kale, different kale says some really out there things on twitter where i'm like are you sure you're catholic bro because uh, i got i got questions Sorab Amari, I don't know if you know who he is. A little he bit. Blocked, he blocked Kale Zeldin. Okay. That was surprising. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think What's I think fun? Jacob, the Twitter numbers don't match the StreamYard numbers for watchers. That's, that's for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I don't know what to make of that. And apparently, Twitter has a media platform thing that gives you more detailed analytics. I don't have access. Uh, someday they say they're going to review my account, but it's been like seven months. So I don't think they're ever actually going to. I think their software's broken and I've reached out to them and that's pointless. And but, although reaching out to Google fixed my Google stuff amazingly, which was wonderful. That that happened in a day even, which is amazing because that was months broken too. So, you know, maybe Twitter will get a, get their act together. Who knows? Well, when Elon bought Twitter, he fired two thirds of the employees, and everybody was like, "Oh, I guess Twitter's going to go down," and it didn't. No, it got and better. <laughs> and so that was that was always that was uh, when I did consulting. I would always walk into a place, and I, I would never say this to them, but I was always like, "You guys could get rid of about eighty percent of these people, and your software would improve overnight." <laughs> And and so uh, apparently the less the rest of Silicon Valley went, hmm, maybe we could do some cuts. Um. <laughs> See, that was one of his better tweets. But given tweets like that, if you don't understand why people would block him, I don't know what to tell you. About Only seen that. him on YouTube. Never seen him on Twitter. 
I've seen him on YouTube, yeah, a few times, and that's always interesting. But but his Twitter really is infl. I mean, that's a very inflammatory tweet for Protestants. I'm sorry, I I made it worse because me. But yeah, I mean, I I doubled down on that because I was like, oh, this is like kind of juicy tweet. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so all of that I'm looking at right there. I'm like, yeah, Twitter's not for me. I shouldn't go near it. But if you but if you don't log in and you just link it through Streamyard. Me, I mean, I don't know. Stream, yeah. I'm content with YouTube. YouTube is big enough. I don't know, Father. I'm still uh, gunning for you to be Pope in a few years. And Boy, like, you and you and Mark need to get together on that then. Uh, <laughs> and Adam, Adam's already on the board with that. So yeah, yeah. how many cardinals do you have on board with this plan? Because I'm not even old enough to be elected a bishop yet. Is there a minimum age? Thirty-five. I mean, the Pope could just say, "Eh, whatever." You but you don't. You don't need to be a bishop to be Pope. I know. Understood. Understood. I would be consecrated a bishop immediately upon arriving in Rome. I understand the law here. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know why you're. Uh, why are you tied up with this? Because we need to get this rolling. Like, we got problems that need fixed yesterday. I, Come on. I think. I think we have better candidates out there. I absolutely cannot be true. I just denied immediately. I, I am willing to let you uh, take my proxy vote. Like every single vote I get in the conclave, I designate Father Eric can vote can vote all of my votes in the conclave. Every single one. No, no, you you you, you need to convince cardinals to vote correctly. That's the, that's what he's telling you to do. Well, I'm going to be meeting a cardinal on Tuesday. Cardinal Burke is coming to uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota for a, uh, a uh, there's a, uh, a home in Warsaw, North Dakota, dedicated for expecting mothers in tough situations. They can just come there free of charge, have their kids, all of that. It's a very small operation, it takes a lot of resources to run something like that, and it doesn't scale well. Yep. They've had donors come and say, we got to get this bigger, and it's like, no, dude. We don't. You can't make it bigger. Like we can maybe have ten, ten mothers here at a time. Um, and so the uh, priest who runs it is a, a good friend of Cardinal Burke, and I get to MC that mass. Oh, and great! My, my dad will be the deacon for it, so you know it'll be a very efficiently run mass because it's going to be the two it. of us. I love it. That's fantastic. That's exciting. Yeah, I think there's something about caring. Caring only scales horizontally, not vertically. And people don't understand scale. <laughs> like, argh, yeah, very frustrating. I yeah. understand scale. Do large scale computing projects. You'll understand scale real quick, or you'll fail miserably and not know why. Either one. <laughs> I mean, like preaching tells me about scale, you know, because like I think my message is clear. And then I talk to somebody about it and they yeah. heard something else. Now, oftentimes the something else is helpful to them, right? So like I preach about, you know, making Advent a penitential season and they feel they need to be more grateful to God for things in their life. It's like not going to complain about you practicing gratitude to God. But that isn't what I meant. Right. Well, well, and that's and that's I like I get upset with Peterson and, and Peugeot and oh, the postmoderns had a point what that you can't send only one message through language because it's actually not possible is that is that really is this some groundbreaking news like it just seems like a captain obvious moment to me and every three-year-old but whatever like if you think that's a point or a like a a thing that it, it took some iq points to come up with i guess uh, i got questions Good question. Postmoderns in the 1960s and 70s were first to discover that language could be ambiguous <laughs> and right. that puns were something that were possible. Like, exactly, that's exactly it. I'm just like, is this some real revelation for real? Like, did did you really? listen? Oh, like you've been busy, so you didn't listen. But you might want to listen to the rest of history. They did a five-part series on Martin Luther. I've gotten to the first two parts. <laughs> When they got to Sola Scriptura, like they were dunking on Luther, like that, <laughs> like isn't I that? How, I, don't, I don't know how anybody ever thought that 
uh, perspicuity of scripture was going to work. <laughs> the idea that scripture, yeah, you just read it and you understand it and everybody should just be on board with it. Because the only way that you can corrupt it is if somebody goes in there and corrupts it. And it's like, ah, it's just... <laughs> Yeah, because there's no original sin. We're all perfect in nature. I mean, I'm pretty sure Rousseau taught us that, and he was right about everything. So yeah, not it's the part. Um, yeah, but they 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 called it Tosh, which is apparently um, a uh, a British way of saying it's BS. Yeah. But but it's the it's it's not even that you know it is that but it, it's it's the solas it's this alone thing, nothing is alone, nothing is unconnected from the world. Like that's where the individualism seems to come from is this idea of alone. Where are you getting alone in this world? Like what what piece in this world do you move, and it only moves that piece in the way you intend, and nothing else is affected. When even, did that ever happen? Even physicists know better than that. Right. I technically them. am having a mild gravitational effect on a star billions of parsecs away. Exactly. And, and the sun. And the sun, right. But even, even farther than that. And a giant supermassive... We, we're connected somehow by and the, gravity. And the I don't understand how it works, but... And the butterfly effect. And, and like it just goes on and on and on and on and on, right? And then yeah, they come up with these solas, and I'm like, I don't know how dumb you have to be, but like, and and this goes back to the scaling problem. You say one thing, and and when you sample the people that heard it, you get very different ideas about what they got out of what you said. And so it's like you can't move one piece and have it move exactly the way you want without moving a bunch of other stuff in ways you can't understand. And I don't know why people aren't aware of this. I guess I guess they don't talk to enough other people. So but and the power in that is to use it backwards. So yesterday we were hanging out in my Discord server and uh you know we were we were talking about something or other and then um I was like oh that's a good theme for for next Friday's uh, live stream on navigating patterns is, you know, I, I might not name it this, but something like communion, right? And they were like, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. And everybody kept talking, right? And so they're all coming up with these ideas and, and talking and, and sometimes not meaning to talk about communion, but I'm making these connections, and writing them down. And then I get a free live stream. I don't have to do any work for it. It's fantastic. It I works get, both I get a ways. Almost free live stream every week. I, yeah, I do no. what ten minutes of talking, and then uh, the rest is user generated content. I'm, I'm, I'm. Yes, I'll be sending you a bill. Don't worry. Uh, to address what Nico said, no matter how bad your opinion of Martin Luther is, the more you learn about him, the worse your opinion will get. <laughs> that that's true of most people. I mean, this is why conversation won't save the world. The more you dig in, the more you, disagreement you find. The more detail you go into, the more the, the the worse people get, right? The more details you know about their life, the less perfect they appear. Oops. Yep. That's why um, forgiveness is uh, pretty important because otherwise everything will come to a grinding halt. I, uh, I just have to forgive the bishop today uh, when he uh, said we'll leave at eleven forty-five. You know, and I, I asked him when he wanted to leave, and then he asked me when I wanted to leave, and I said 11.45 would be great. Um, no, not 9.45, 9.45, whatever. And uh, and then he comes down there after asking me what time I wanted to leave and uh, comes down at 9.55, and it's like, it's just not as German as I am. That's all there is to it. <laughs> No, Which Germany. reminds me, uh, Cardinal Burke, isn't he the one that got into a fight with the Pope? Yeah, but he's a cardinal. He's supposed to do that. <laughs> That's their job. No, seriously, once you're at the level of cardinal, you are a part of the Senate of the Pope. That is one of your duties. You are an advisor to the Pope. So, like, part of being a good advisor is saying, hey, Holy Father, I don't think that's right. 
right? And maybe even saying that publicly. Like, he's he's freaking earned doing that, right? The Cardinal definitely can do that. I, I didn't know about the publicly part. I think, I think a little bit of publicly isn't the worst thing, right? Because we live in a society. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, that, I, I don't think it's wrong to do it publicly. I do think it's wrong, however, to have Ted on the stream without publicly welcoming him. So, how you doing? Hey, uh, great. It's uh, lovely to have reproductions of my photons uh, projected digitally next to yours. It's, uh, <laughs> it's as close as we can get to being together without um, going to Arkansas. This is true, because I guess I don't leave. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you will you will hey. if i ever do a thing out here ted you'll have to yeah. he was sleeping right there it's true the the legend lives on jacob it was that was good i was really really tired i think i had i don't know there if there's ever a four-day period of my life where i talked so much as leading up to sleeping in your apartment like it was unbelievable it was like 7 a.m. My father remembers of the campground. It was like everyone woke up and it was like, okay, here's some coffee. Okay, also Jonathan Bejo and Jordan Peterson and everything this conference is about. I'm like, okay, this I like I love talking and this is overwhelming. And it literally it went from like 7 30 a.m. until 11 p.m. at night around the campfire with with no stops the whole freaking time. Every single day we were there. <laughs> and Ted, I don't know if you noticed this. I didn't sleep a wink that entire time. Like by the time no. I got to Sunday morning, I had two cups of coffee and one of <laughs> Chad's and I was still tired. So I had one of Chad's crazy uh, energy drinks that has 300 milligrams of caffeine in it. And that got me back to normal. <laughs> I think I didn't notice how little you slept because like the moment you that fell I was right like, asleep, I was exactly. so envious. Yes, it was like the moment the moment that like someone wasn't talking to me it was just like and I was gone. Except the first night when we went in there into the tent and like I don't know what had happened, but there was like close to four hundred mosquitoes in the tent. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're all just like congregated at the top. Like, Are you waiting here for us to eat us? Is that the <laughs> that tender German skin, they knew it was coming. They're like, We're we're gonna get them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness how do you get mosquitoes in your tent come on amateur i don't there wasn't even we didn't a set the in tent there. up no no they were already set up which you know i shouldn't you know i'm not going to look a gift tent in the mouse or mouth or whatever it is but there was a lot of mosquitoes in there so yeah it's funny that you just mentioned cardinal burke i he was at the pilgrimage in oklahoma this fall so he mm -hmm. offered mass at the end of that which was it was wonderful. This is the first mass I'd ever been to with a cardinal. It was. This will only be my second mass with a cardinal. Well, wow, wait, is he coming up to, to y'all? North Dakota. Yeah. Really wonderful. When? Yeah. For what? Tuesday for a fundraising banquet, for a <laughs> uh, a a home for expecting mothers, in North Dakota. Wonderful. Oh, that's great. It is a is a very worthy charity. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it was it was fun too. We when at the pilgrimage we got in like we're way at the back, and so we thought you know, like the church at the abbey is completely full, and we're just out in the grass, and it's like all right, I guess we're gonna hear the mass piped in through some bad speakers, and then you know here comes the the procession with Cardinal Burke like four feet from us, and like oh okay, there's there's some compensation to where we were. <laughs> the funny the funny thing at the end of the pilgrimage is like you get to the people who are holding who hold like the, the standard the banner from your chapter they get to like go and stand behind the high altar and so it's like it's really cool because you get to be right there and see everything but it's also like we just walked 35 miles in the last 36 hours and like can you stand there for a pontifical high mass without passing out holding this thing and and i said no and gave the flag to a younger man and <laughs> said go for it because i'm like i'm pretty sure that i would like i would fall over <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that uh, that pilgrimage sounds real cool. We'll see if I can make it, but yeah, it'd be great. It would I'll be, have, it'd be great. Next next fall will be my last semester where I have two classes online, and it should just be one class a semester after that. 
So I might have a little more freedom. But next fall is also when the diocese is probably going to be going to the ordinary jubilee year in uh, in Rome. So, Ooh. cool. Every twenty five years we have an ordinary jubilee. I know it's not fifty like it's supposed to be in the law of Moses, but you know it's what we do, Jacob. Um, and then they had a very big jubilee year on uh, the year two thousand because that was a new millennium. So, is it ju- hold on jubilees every fifty years? So you guys just decide. We just we just do it. Yeah, it's just like how we talk about doing a Sabbath rest on Sunday. We just we just do what we want. Apparently, <laughs> um, you'll find this interesting. So um, I kept on hearing that uh, the JWs, the witnesses, were celebrate their Easter on the Jewish Passover. The Jewish Passover. And then I find out that theirs is like a month off. I'm like, what's going on at this year? So I start looking into it. And I find out that according to their theology, they go according to the lunar calendar, but they decide when to add an extra month based on when the Catholic Church um, has Easter. So to make sure that they don't do it at the same time? No, to make sure that it's closer. Huh. Huh. (laughs) That's very strange that that? the the JWs would be looking at the Catholic Church at all to be like, when are they celebrating? We should do it at the same time. (laughs) They're going to split the baby. I guess. If, If you tell any witness about this, they will be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Just come on over, guys. You're already you're already basing your Easter at the same time as us. We'll get all these kinks in your theology worked out. We'll, we'll, we'll be done with that tritheism stuff. It's fine. We'll get you back on a on a good Trinitarian basis. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, you just you just broke Jacob. You said the words "good" and "Trinitarian" together. I know. No, so, you made Jake, a distinction between Trinitarian and tritheism. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Jacob, you'll appreciate this. You know how the witnesses are all about how they got like JW.org? Yeah. And you know how, in, you may not know this, but in Spanish, the, the JWs are called Testigos de Jehovah. Mm-hmm. But in Latin America, everything is still JW.org. So it makes it makes no sense. And they're just like, yeah, we're like the Testigos de Jehovah also go to JW.org. And I'm sure everyone's like, why are you so proud of this URL that you have that has no connection with your beliefs or name? So I just thought that was fun. It must have been very expensive to get a two letter uh, two letter URL. You know, sometimes those guys there's there's they, they sneak in there and get the early stuff like some of the some of the stuff that Mormons have invested in, I don't know if this is still true, but like four or five years ago, I was reading about how like the Mormon church's investment fund is the largest or second largest investment fund in the world now. Yeah. They're just like, you wouldn't think it, but apparently they're like really, really savvy investors. So, yeah. you know, they do, one- they do have the capacity to think long term. Right. Very long <laughs> yeah. term. Right. And so there's a lot of, you know, Protestant churches can't manage, but like the Mormons have, like, yeah. they they build the the infrastructure, they build the institutions, they run it. I don't know how well it runs. I'm on the outside, but like, they seem to to be able to keep things running. They've got, but they've got little signs painted into the desert and stuff about where to go in case of nuclear attack. Like they're they're way, right? Yeah, they're wow. way organized. So every Mormon is supposed to either have three or six months of emergency food yep. in that home. Yep. Wow. They're, they're all prepared for, for, for a catastrophe at all times. That's a requirement. Yeah, it's not. Oh, so maybe that's why that uh, monastery in a canticle for Leibowitz was in Utah. <laughs> yes, Father, that's fantastic. Uh, it's, a, yeah. it's a fun book. It's a fun book. Anybody who hasn't read it, a canticle for Leibowitz. You need to know a little Latin and a little theology to get all the jokes, but the main plot's available to anyone. Yeah, you don't You don't even need to know it, though, for it to just be like one. Uh, it is a wild ride. That is a it's not what you think it is. Basically, I went back. I, I went back and reread it this uh, a few months ago, and it was 
it was it was totally worth a reread. It was hitting me really hard with some of this stuff. I'm not going to go into too much more. Uh, yeah, no spoilers. Just read it. It's a great book. Even Pseudo Boethius agrees. Canticle for Leibowitz, great book! Exclamation point. Wow. Well, that, that settles it then. The testimony of three witnesses cannot be denied. There you go. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, oh my. They, they use that in computers. What? Three witnesses? Yeah, all the technology, uh, the, the original technology that Google invented for the search engine to make it fast is based on a quorum, which is three nodes have to agree. And then that makes the data in those three nodes, if they agree, uh, canonical. And that's the end of that. And that's is that the is that the actual terminology they use? Um, some of it. They use quorum. It's called quorum, a quorum, but not canonical. Uh, it might be listed as canonical. Uh, it's been a long time since I read the Google paper. I read it after it came out. That was a hell of a long time ago. I don't remember okay, all the okay. words. That's fine. But, like, fine. All the technologies after that also, you know, they're all based on the Google white paper. Like everything you're using, YouTube, all, uh, Facebook, all of it. Mark, it just cracks me up because sometimes you just rattle off so much stuff that I assume that you're just like, your like confidence and your confidence measure on the, your things you say are like 60%. And then you'll just stop and be like, I don't know. And I'm like, dang, Mark's actually like got like probably a really high certainty on like everything he said. <laughs> True. I, you know I what really I mean? Do. Like, it's a I, but it's a trick, Ted. This is the funny part. I'm like, guys, it's a trick. It's called only speak when you know what you're talking about. It's really not that right. hard. And the, funny, and the funny thing is, is it sounds you can seem like, like, oh man, you also know you like you have something to say about everything. It's like, yeah, if you have the capacity to connect two things, then then you always have something to say. Like, you don't have to know anything about what's going on. You just have to know how to connect what's being said to something that you actually know, and then you always. Or, or you're just quiet when when you don't know what people are talking about. So the whole wow. time you guys were talking about Chino, I didn't say a word. That's like the book of Proverbs or something. Even a fool is seen as wise when he keeps his mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trick. It's yeah. a trick. I just shut up. It's a trick. It's real easy. But people That's feel so compelled funny. to speak, to fill space, right? Or to be heard. Or, or, or because other people are getting attention and then, and you know, I, I don't want to be mean about it. Like, it's not like they want to steal the attention, but they're like, oh, other people are getting attention. So I should be like them and get attention too. Right. And so they, they feel compelled to speak and it's like, yeah, but, but, but maybe you have nothing to offer. And so maybe you should just like, leave it alone. <laughs> like that time I took you out to dinner with a bunch of other priests. Oh Yeah. Yeah, that was that was lovely. I learned so much. You know how you learn things by, by not talking, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe asking the occasional question when you when you feel like you know enough to ask it. Because a lot of that time, I just didn't even. I if I wanted to ask a question right now, what would I ask? And I'm like, yeah, I got nothing. All right, shut up then. <laughs> not hard. I was I was in a situation like that earlier this week where I was around some people who had like. A, a hilarious amount of knowledge about climbing ropes. It was these friends of my friend that I do tree work with. It was exactly that, Mark. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to hang tight for about 45 minutes. And I think I'm going to get a base level mastery of this vocabulary. And then I can start like actually having any idea what's going on enough to ask questions. But there's like throwing off. Oh yeah. Like, I think that's like a, like a nine mil Cleveland or something. And I'm like, okay, I think that's either the I think that's the diameter of the rope, and I'm guessing that's the manufacturer. It might be the, like the braiding technique. I have no idea. It was hilarious. They're just, you know, getting getting thrown into a situation where it's like their shop, and you have no idea what the shop is. It's yeah. just awesome. Well, and and, and the, see, the key is that's how you learn, right? You learn by being around people who know something that you know nothing about, and just not freaking talking. <laughs> There's a. There's another side to that too, and about the capacity to not talk, which for those of you who know me at all is pretty probably it's like Ted thinks not talking is great. Wow, he should practice more of it. Um, but there's this Wendell Berry poem about a grandfather and his grandson sitting on a porch. And he says that they're, they're, most of the conversation was, and the quote is, 
uh, the silence of shared knowledge. Mm. 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 Well, 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 if you think about it, though, um, I, I, I'm going to take notes, uh, <laughs> take notes from my Friday live stream. Like that's where you <laughs> commune. You commune in silence, not in speech. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. that's going to be helpful. You'll hear that on Friday on Navigating Patterns now, for sure. Well, you know what's interesting, Mark, is I went to this place where there are all these, these there's some bells and, and all the smoke and a guy who's in a cassock like father, but he was dressed up in like a really fancy white gold and gold thing on top of that. <clears throat> and we're all singing and doing stuff. And then right in the middle of it, there's like 15 minutes of just dead silence. Mm. Pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's like, like what, what's if you're trying to get on the same page with somebody, right? And let's say you really are trying to get up, you got to do a lot of talking and hacking out in the details, right? But when I just like, I get the 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 seminarians together and we process in, it's like okay, we're on the same page. You guys are trained. You know what to do. I could just like wave at you every once in a while or give you a nod, and that lets you know it's time. Right. And 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 the ability to to commune and to communicate in silence is a sign that everybody's properly aligned towards the same goals or the same good. I love that, Father. I've actually you been don't thinking you about don't that. need to talk yeah. anymore. It is just <clears throat> watching the altar boys at church, it's the same thing, right? Where they're like they because of their like knowledge and finesse at it. They're able to like, there's this sort of like weird, like, or I guess infrequently seen combination of like complexity and calm together, right? Because there's this, this whole thing, which is the mass, but they know it well enough that like no one's explaining it. They're just doing it in silence. It's, it's, yeah, it's cool. <clears throat> liturgy only becomes liturgy if you've done it enough times that you're comfortable that it's it's familiar if it's not already familiar if it's not then it's it's really i mean it's it's completely different right when i'm reading something that like when i'm reading a psalm that i've only read so many times it is completely different from reciting a psalm that i've said so many times like i basically know it by heart yeah yeah that is a different I mean, all, experience once it becomes a part of you yeah there's a different struggle which is sustained attention right because you're not being gripped by novelty it's a but yeah uh no i mean you know especially being in the choir at mass like you know you over and there's these parts over and over and over that you get to um but particularly though for the the proper for the very it's these variable portions that are sung at the high mass there's there's four or five of them any rate uh we tip it there's like very complex gregorian versions but then there's something i, I think they're called like the rossini propers they're just they're plain chant right so very straightforward there's only a few variations on them and I, i'm especially in paschal season when we're singing the alleluias in in in, in the gradual it's like there's something about like knowing exactly where my voice is going to go and where all the other men's voices are going to go. And we're all standing in a circle singing these alleluias together. And like, I don't even have to, I almost don't have to do anything to be singing it with them. And it, Jacob, you're right. It's like, it's completely different from when I was like learning Gregorian chant and, and all this stuff. And it's just like, all I'm doing is like white knuckling it to try to not like go off pitch or go somewhere else or like, understand what's going you know there's this you get to this other side of it and it becomes a sort of actually reminds me a lot of Eliot's whole discussion of like you know stillness and movement kind of meeting together there's also something that happens um at least it, it happens a lot more in hebrew than it does in, in other languages but you gain an insight into what a, a certain passage means and it's a new insight even though you've heard that passage so many times and it gives it a permanent depth that is just like also becomes a part of you like there is something 
So, <clears throat> I mean, if you're thinking from an evolutionary psychology point of view, the question becomes, why is it that we don't have meditation in the Western tradition when in the East everybody's meditating? And I think it's because our liturgy is superior to meditation. It's, 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 there's a form of it, yeah. It's, it's, I think it, it, if you are actually participating in liturgy well, including, I mean, what you were talking about, Ted, once it's not novel anymore, make, making you pay attention to the words, even though it's, it's something you have memorized. Um, I, 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 I honestly think it's, it's a superior technology that we discarded. Uh, well, some people discarded <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so people have had to go and try to re-import it from the East. Mm. To, to to some extent, but I want to I want to make a comment. I, I like what you said, Jacob. It was really good. A, a lot of people talk about insight, and you'll hear like John Verveke talk about that. And the way they talk about it is as though it's something coming from inside of them, but actually, insight is something you let in from the outside, which means you have to be open to it, right? That's actually what's happening to you. I mean, even even if it feels like it's coming from the inside, you still have to be open to the change. To the modification, um, whether it's something like you said that you've memorized or know well or have read a hundred times before or whatever, right? And yeah, all the cognitive guys come to the same sets of conclusions. It's like I could have saved you some time, guys. You didn't need to go through all that. We already had these answers, right? But you have to be open to that. I think liturgy in particular is the space that opens you up to 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 being able to have an insight as such. And that's why, you know, the insistence is always that the Holy Spirit comes down upon you and moves you to mm -hmm. speak something, to say something, to make a change, um, rather than, you know, people seizing upon that with their own genius, I guess. So that comment that you threw up there, Father, about Christian monks meditating and, like, Christians meditate. But, I mean, med meditation is an interesting word because we've we've kind of collected a bunch of different things in it and very much to like to what jacob and i were just talking about <clears throat> there's a going you go to like a benedictine monastery that does the latin chant and these guys are they're chanting for they chant through the entire psalms every week right so they're they're hitting all 150 they're doing it four times a month and i, I want to say it's like five hours a day that they're together chanting and they're and it's it's all antiphons, right? So you've got the, the they they're split into two groups, and one will sing one line, and then the other will sing the other line, and then one will, it's, so it's just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. You know, they're doing this for life. So many of them have been there for 30, 40 years, and it's just it, there isn't anything else like it. It's not like the most precise singing. It's not like the most technical singing, but there is something going on there that even when you're just in the same room as them. I mean, I, I remember not even not even being Catholic yet and hearing it and just thinking like this would change you. There's no way this doesn't change oh, you. Yeah. Like, like it is working. It's working. You don't even have to. You don't even have to be singing it. And I and 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 being someone who sings in choir, I know the difference between hearing people sing, and like singing the same words and pitches as the other people right next to you. Like, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that's going on in terms of like what it's like to be in that sort of union with other people to like feel it in your body, all of this stuff. So there's a, there, uh, Jacob, I, I, I want to chew on what you're talking about. Cause there's this sense in which like Eastern meditation is this sort of like non teleological opening. At least that's how I've heard it described as this sort of, you're just dropping patterns. Like don't, don't hold on to that pattern. Don't hold on to that thought. Don't hold on to that notion. Western meditation is, is, oriented towards something it's teleological it's it's right we're gonna we're gonna chew on the psalms we're gonna we're gonna go over them and over them and over them and there's this sense in which there's all there's all kinds of cool stuff that comes out of that like what you're saying like there's this there's a faith that it's worth doing a thousand times and not just once right that there's there's depth there say one way of saying it is 
you have faith that the things that you're meditating on are bigger than you are. Right? Like that there's just more there to mm. it that you haven't you yeah. haven't gotten it all, which is humility. So yeah, That's I, trouble I, with the I word like meditation. That. I think, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> we we definitely equivocate on the word meditation. And there's a big equivocation. And usually what, what people mean is one of three things. Contemplation, right? Yeah. To think deeply about, which is standardly how we might think of meditation. And rumination, um, which happens to be the topic of one of my live streams, and navigating patterns, just saying. Um, right? But there are three different concepts because there are three different ways of approaching thought, right? And, and, and that's kind of important. And they're somewhat tied to time, I would say, as well. That's the case I made in my live stream anyway. Um, and, and that's really important because we do have it in the West, but, but the fundamental difference between West and East, and you talked to Corey about this, right? And Nesbitt was on, I was on to this in geography of thought, like, yeah, there's a, it's maybe it's not non-teleological in the East, but, but there's a different flavor, right? They're very cyclical in their thought, very cyclical. And we are, are much less cyclical in our thought. And and it's just it it's a hard limitation, a hard constraint. That's why you can't just pick up Buddhism as a Westerner. It's just not going to work. It's not going to have the same effect. You're, you're almost nobody can do that. And 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 sadly, the Easterners can pick up the Western way of thinking for whatever reason. Oh, so Mark, it's interesting that you brought up the the difference between the sort of cyclicality and the directionality in the East and the directionality of the West. I've, and I wish I could remember where this came from. This might be Barf Owen Barfield, but I remember coming across a very convincing historical argument that it's it's the Hebrews that were the first people to break out of this cyclical view of reality. That John everyone Kajiki, every spoke, speaks about that in Awakening for the Meaning Crisis. Yeah. Okay. He yeah, probably picked it up from Barfield. I, I'm certain he's read him, but yeah. The idea that the world had a beginning is is a religious idea that until the 1930s the scientific establishment thought the catholic scientists were trying to uh bring in from their bible <laughs> and they were trying to keep it out as religious dogma yes do you know do you know the like real the math the math that shows that 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 the universe can't be eternal uh, infinite and static. It's so awesome. It's called the dark sky, uh, the, the dark sky paradox. So the idea is, cause the idea, right. What Jacob is saying is, is, is dead on. They, they're like, oh yeah, the universe is infinite and it's eternal and it's not changing because if you have an infinite and eternal universe that's changing, then you run into all kinds of problems. But the issue with an infinite static and eternal universe is that when you go out into outside and you look up, if you have an infinite, eternal, and uniform universe, then the light from a star will be directly in your eye anywhere you look. It doesn't matter. Right. Every single angle that you, any any you know segment of the sky is going to be is going to have a you can trace a direct line to a star. And so the fact that it gets dark at night actually demonstrates that the universe has a beginning, mm -hmm. and that it's and that it's yeah. So it's either at least finite temporally or spatially. One of those has to be, there has to be a limit on at least one of those. The fact that we have nighttime, because otherwise it would be like looking into the sun everywhere that you look all the time, because there's always light coming from a star in, you know, every but single possible It was a little path. more sustainable for the ancients to believe um, the universe was eternal because they, they didn't quite know how many stars that we know about. <laughs> We know about a lot more stars now. We just, we've gone and looked. We've got tools that we can go look and say, hot diggity, there are, a, like, when Abraham was promised that his descendants would be more than the stars <laughs> of the sky, I'm sure he was impressed by it. And it's only gotten more and more impressive as uh, scientific resolution has uh, has <laughs> progressed. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it is actually interesting because, I mean, all the you know the ones that i've heard of like the stuff from hinduism the stuff from mesoamerica there's always this it's not the sort of it wasn't the sort of static eternal universe that materialism that like modernist materialism was saying but it was actually cataclysmic cycles right so right. it's like you're basically bouncing back and forth between the sort of chaos and and creation where you go through a cycle of however many thousand years and then everything gets burned up and it comes back and right. it's like 
there even so there's this sense it's sort of it's sort of like contained growth or something like that but you never you never get anywhere there's no like again there's no directionality there's no consummation but honestly those are, i actually find those more sophisticated than the views in the in the sort of 19th century science which is like yeah, yeah this is just what it is it's always like this it's always been like this it'll always be like this which is amazing because you can still get men like Neil deGrasse Tyson who will tell you and Carl Sagan who are like the universe is all the cosmos are all that ever is ever was and ever will be it's like yeah it's, <laughs> it's weird well the Mayan <laughs> too have a cyclical catastrophic calendar right well yeah. only only theirs is self-similarly fractal repeating which is even cooler it's like yeah this is old this is old stuff but but i think also i mean you have to you can't you can't discount the utility in giving the answer to quiet the three-year-old of it's eternal in other words don't waste your brain power trying to figure out where the universe began or or or, or which is equivalent in western thought to trying to know god right don't waste your brain on that right because it, mm. it's actually an important message. Like, no, 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 don't waste, don't waste your brain on that. Waste your brain on figuring out how to grow enough food to feed the culture or the village. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, but even then, it's, I mean, if you just take the sort of basic evolutionary perspective, the fact that people could be driven to extinct, like to starvation by the fact that they're answering a question that has no survival utility right. tells you that you haven't answered the whole question. Right. 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 I mean, that's where we get Big Bang from. I mean, Big Bang is from that phenomenon I just discussed, right? The monk yeah. was like, all right, I'm just going to give you a stupid answer. So you shut up and move on. <laughs> We're going to move this lesson on, okay? Because otherwise you get into the three-year-old trap of why, 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 which is great, which is great and fun. And I, I, I do enjoy playing that game sometimes because, <laughs> you know. I'm still three, <laughs> uh, but but also like it's got to end at a certain point. You can't can't do that forever, right? The rebellion must end. And then you just end it with, and this all men call God. And this <laughs> is that Saint Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, the the final end towards which everything reaches, and this all men call God. Nice. Y yeah, Aquinas's proofs for the exit, like the little bit that I've encountered with them, like they're not like, um, what would you call it? Tools for evangelization, first of all, because like almost no one understands them, especially not until you've well, um, like, contemplated you can them. Get, you can do some pretty good work with the argument for motion, which is the first <laughs> one and the simplest one, right? Motion, yes. and for motion, uh, Thomas Aquinas, motion means any kind of causality, not just local motion. Yeah, cause out. That's right. Yeah, yeah, um, hmm. um, yeah. Or any kind of change, not causality. Change, any kind of change. Um, like you can, you know, William Lane Craig. You know, he he could, he could do stuff with that. But uh, you you, you don't want to go for like you know the object. Um, I think it's the fourth way. Is is What's the fourth um, way? What is the fourth way? That's the one that everyone that's just like that, that so. trips everybody up. That that there's a, an end towards which everything in the universe is directed towards, and it it has to be directed because it's extremely Aristotelian, right? And it, unless you've got unless you already agree with Aristotle about the necessity for final cause, which is already great and will be great. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, you, if you don't already agree with Aristotle about the necessity of final cause, then it literally makes no sense. Yeah. It's but, just, it's I mean, just incomprehensible. At least as I've heard it from modern Dominicans, the, the idea of the, of these arguments for the existence of God, they're not, again, they're not primarily tools of evangelization, but they're like, like methods of contemplation to change your, to like to deepen your understanding of God, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's not, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm going to walk this path myself so that I can come say, let's say realize, oh boy, all the ver words I want to use here are, are, are dangerous. Essentially just like realize how essential God is, which is like a funny way to say it, but like to heal that gap, that, that divide between God and his creation to realize like that we're, that'd be one way to say it like that, that, because all the stuff that I hear is like, it's very like, it's ways of seeing that like God is like holding creation together actively. It's it's very much like anti-deistic. 
right? It's not, it's not deism. It's like really not deism. It's like all this stuff is coming from God and it's coming back to him. And like, you can just, you can see it just by contemplating existence. Not because any the particular way, existence. The second way existence. would still work in a infinite temporal universe. Oh, interesting. Is that the one about goodness? Basically? No, 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 that's, that's, that's the causality. That is the causality. Okay. So the, the first way is change. The second way is causality. Um, and his his argument still works even if you admit a temporally infinite universe. Because something had to set things going. Yeah. Something had to move things. Yeah. It just seems to me that while, I mean, yes, I believe in an agentic God and it's great to discuss this thing, these things. Can we start with the idea that if you don't at least believe in deism, you're an idiot. <laughs> Being as good is where you start. I mean, I remember uh, I, I, Dr. Peterson had a, uh, a conversation with Bishop Barron like a month or six weeks ago, and uh, Bishop Barron or Dr. Peterson started off with being super excited that. Um, the uh, uh, AI language models could disprove postmodernism, and, <laughs> and I was like, you get, "You're giving you're giving these postmoderns way too much credit, Doc. You just need to mock them. Like, Are you treat sure the that fool wasn't... according to his folly, something like that." It was oh, just like we did earlier on this very stream. That is yeah. correct. Yeah, it's just like. Ah, oh, Doc, come on! You, you're taking these guys way too seriously. So, I feel the same way about atheists. It's just like, look, man, you could say, you could say, I don't think we could know anything about that, but obviously, there's something bigger. I might be able to respect that, but uh, yeah, the nothing exploded into everything is is not okay. The the discussion <laughs> Peterson had with Dennett was boring and. He, Dennett just sounded like a doddering old fool. That he's always sounded that way to me. I'm I'm glad everybody else is catching up with the fact that he always sounded that way. Well, that was I mean that was the weird thing about Peterson's discussion with Richard Dawkins several years ago, where it was like I remember thinking the same thing, where it's like Dawkins like doesn't even understand the questions Peterson's asking here. Like this is we it was weird. It was, and he, you know, and he, and Peterson's like, here's this pretty serious question. And I'm like, yeah, that's a pretty good question. And, and Dawkins is like, I just don't understand that why anyone would ever want to know the answer to that because it's not science. And I'm like, oh, right. right. Oh. Well, until he sees it, Chad, right. And then when he sees it and he answers, that would mean, you know, you can hear the fear in his voice. It was so fascinating. It was right at the end. It's just like, no, don't end it there. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if you just don't look far enough, right? Don't don't look so far that you see that there's black there, and there's no stars shining through. Sorry. Speaking of, did I bring up did I bring up the eclipse last week? No, that was this week. Wow. Yeah. The eclipse was wild. Up. The eclipse was totally wild. I can't believe. Wow, that was just Monday. This has been a full week. Um, yeah, the eclipse was wild. The eclipse was... I had a, I had a friend ask me uh, the day before. He's like, what do you think this eclipse means? I was like, I think it means that God is pleased to fill creation with glorious things. I think that's what the eclipse means. <laughs> Good answer. I like that answer. Every We're once still... in a while, something really cool is going to happen. And you're going to want to yeah. be around for it. Yeah, yeah. Because so, I got to see the eclipse in 2017, and that, you know, on reflection, I realized I'm really not that rational, because you just put the moon in front of the sun, and for two minutes, or two and a yeah, half minutes, just, or however long it been, no rational behavior out of me whatsoever. No, nope, nope, you're just like running around. Complete animal yelling. chaos. <laughs> well, and, and nature. Nature goes nuts. In 2017, yes. I was here. I wasn't in the house yet, but I was physically here all day working on stuff in the yard and stuff. And man, did things get weird. And I was like, things are getting weird. And the last one, things got weird. The light changes. And like, oh, yeah. how do you, so I'm not in the totality by any means, 80% here or some or 85, something in that range. I can't tell you how the light was weird, but I can tell you that the light was weird. The last like five minutes leading into totality. And then the totality is just, it's, it is 
dude, it's like getting pulled into another world. But the relevant thing that I was going to say is, is that sort of relevant to all of this, to the Peterson Spear and, and Jonathan Peugeot and everything, was that afterwards I realized, with the, so you've got the moon and it's one of the most perfectly circular things when you see the shadow of the moon, it's just unbelievably circular. And then it's got this massive silver corona around it. I mean, it's just, it's beyond beautiful. And it struck me, I was like, where have I seen something like that before? And I was like, oh yeah, in Byzantine iconography, when our Lord is depicted, frequently he's shown in front of a circle of black, which is the divine darkness, look, referencing uh, Mount Sinai. And then there's a halo of glory around that. And I was like, yeah. that is the closest thing in nature I've ever seen to like that particular idea of the sort of, there's a sort of like unseeable darkness that's then like then emitting glory that comes out into the visible world. So I just thought that was a really cool, just cool. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Was it was it super trafficy? Because a lot of people went and they ran into traffic. So what was really funny, Mark, is that well, we drove from our house to my parents' house, and that was like across the path of the hotel, like in like deeper in. I think we would have been on like two minutes, and they're at four, over four minutes there. But it was twenty percent of the traffic on our regular Monday. Like it was dead. Like I thought I was back in COVID land. There was no one out. Right. It was just, Arkansas was the best place to go see this, apparently. Yeah. Knew? And a bunch of people came down from northwest Arkansas. So we had, like, west west of the eclipse path. Like, there was a lot. Yeah, a lot of people got stuck in traffic. But all the driving I did around that, yeah, they were like, oh, yeah, there's going to be, like, millions of people in Arkansas. And there's going to be no food on the grocery stores. And, like, expect bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic everywhere. And, no, it felt like a holiday. It was weird. I mean, which all, you know, it's already, like, as you're saying, Mark, it's just, even when you get into the partial clips, you're like, things are not the way that they usually are. And so that all, it all really added to this kind of feeling of surrealness. Yeah. It, one of the things this time that was really cool too, was even after the totality passed and what's weird, funny is it's like, it's getting darker and darker and darker. And it feels like, like something's wrong with your eyes or it feels so dark right before the totality hits. It, it, and then it's on... like when in old movies when they just put a blue lens on the uh on the uh yes. camera to film yep. at night, but it still has that really is, crisp shadows. That is exactly what my brother said, Father. He said yep. he's like, This is one of those like old day for night um film scenes from it from an old movie. That's exactly what it looks like. But in your as soon as it passes, like because you're not going from light to dark, you're going from dark to light, it immediately feels like full daylight again. But then you could look out to the northeast and it was like the just like the sky is dark. It's not clouds. It's not like it was just like it's just dark over there. Like there's no there's no sunlight in that column, you know, the column of atmosphere over to the into the northeast. It was weird. It was really weird. Seeing stars in the middle of the day, there's like the the tree frog started. There's this tree frog that started singing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah the, yeah, the the animals uh, get confused and they get yeah. quiet before it, and then when it gets dark, they're like, "Oh, it must be nighttime," and they fire yes. up. And yeah, like, that's weird. These are nighttime sounds, and then it and then it goes away. Yeah, the crick the crickets at like one thirty. It was like one twenty in the afternoon. I think the eclipse came through at one fifty. At one twenty, my friend, one of my friends who was there, is like, "Wait, you can hear crickets," and it was really weird because there's so many all these noise levels, and then I finally was able to get right at the crickets. It's like, oh my goodness, there are crickets. This is so weird. Yeah, and you also like little um if you like put your fingers together i can't do this because i'm holding an ipad but if you like crossed your fingers um it would form pinhole cameras all yep. of the intersection points would form pinhole cameras and you see so you'd see like five or six or seven of the of the shape of the sun projected on the ground it's just and then and then there's weird stuff too because um there's a lot more diffusion in the direction of the crescent than the other way and so like if you had like a like a your finger shadow like this in in one direction it's uh, it's really sharp, and then as you turn ninety degrees, it gets really fuzzy mm. because you're getting diffused. You've got like a wide light in one direction and a narrow, like a very narrow aperture in the other. Just all, all it just everything that all the ways that we're used to sunlight behaving, so much of it just goes right out the window, and you've got weird like fuzzy shadows, and sh you can see like my children, you could see the hair, individual the shadows of individual hairs because the sun's turning into a pinhole camera. You could see right. it cast on the ground. Yeah, it. 
Well, they I, do I physics how... experiments during these things for a reason, right? Because a bunch of physics stuff is either no longer relevant or breaks. <laughs> and they're like, we got to measure this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool. And, you know, it's one of those weird things where, like, I think, I think it was my wife that was saying this, that, like, we just assume this sort of constancy in life. And then every once in a while, this thing just comes out of somewhere and everything gets turned upside down. And it's like, it's worth remembering that like things like that do happen. There's this sort yeah. of sense of, of uh, givenness, not in a positive sense, givenness and like, it's all a done deal and we all know how it's gonna turn out and there's really no reason to think about it. I mean, Chesterton is always going on about the miracle of the ordinary, right? The miracle is not that cra something crazy happened. The miracle is like that so much just rolls along peacefully that's 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 the great miracle of creation and many things are very very regular in this great miracle of creation like father much ending like my, the live stream at 9 30 i knew it i was gonna like, love that one right over home plate for you <laughs> yeah thank you thank you uh <clears throat> so it is uh 9 30 and that means by law and by custom we will now end this live stream so uh good night and god bless you all